And welcome, I'm Mangino. You're listening to the Mangino Talks podcast with me, John Shokoski of the odd, mysterious, fascinating history of Pittsburgh. And John, after working with you now for seven years, we're always looking for different ways of trying to make this information new and fresh. And at the same time, recognizing that there are explorations down caverns that we've not even really explore. I mean, we realize the opening is there and maybe took a step or two in, but really not dove in, if you will, and decided to go in deep. And right now we're looking at world firsts and it surprises me that in a city like Pittsburgh, where we've only really been a city for what few hundred years, right? That there could be so many world first associated with this city. Were you kind of blown away when yeah. you started digging into this to discover that? A hundred percent, 100 percent. And um, I'll preface by saying that uh, what is would you what would you even consider a world first to be? So I, there are certain things that you're undeniably <clears throat> considered a world first like the first person to um, create the Ferris wheel. You know, mm -hmm. that's a very noticeable, you know, it's, it's a very unique thing. There's not many other people out there making giant wheels that go round and round uh, during that time period. It's a very noticeable, iconic thing that you could say was first and not the last because people have made things. But this is really where it began with mm -hmm. one guy, you know, a one guy, his idea, but did it? And that is the question that I ask myself with every single one of these factoids that I've come across throughout the years uh, about everything that we've ever talked about, but especially about world firsts. Because when you make a claim uh, beyond any other city and any other town or any other human being that's ever done something, uh, and you say, no, some guy in Pittsburgh did it, in fact, first, mm -hmm. and uh, you better have, you better know exactly what you're talking about, number one. Number two, have proof. Now, most of claims that you hear, very little proof exists. As hard as it seems to even think about this idea that you, you wouldn't even think about looking into whether this is true or not, like the invention of the sewing machine, okay? The invention of the sewing machine, most people think was Singer, you know, brand. Or right. something. they even claim it. Singer claims that they invented the, the sewing machine, but they didn't. There was another man who did it. He just didn't patent it, you know, but there's clear evidence that this guy did it years beforehand, hmm. uh, spent his whole life and just failed. Uh, but he did, he did do it. So does it count? Who's first singer or this guy, the person to sell it and to make it successful or the person who came up with the idea. Now, even that guy, where does ID come from? Probably a different machine that did a similar type of thing. They said, you know what? I think I could do a machine like this that I could sew. Right. Right. Yeah. So like so even that idea wasn't even an original idea. So where do these ideas of world firsts and things come from? And does it matter if you're first? Does it? Well, I, I think that it's cool that you're first. I, I, I think in, in my mind, it's greater that we have it than who's first. But I do think it's important to recognize not only the person who really did it first, but as you were just describing, what were the contributing factors mm -hmm. to make that possible for it to be the first, whether it's a sewing machine or That's anything right. else? And that is where Pittsburgh specifically, I think, has a unique uh, and visionary tale to tell uh, that's different than some other cities that I've looked into or other claims. Why do you think that is? It's a combination of things. I think, one, it had to do with the fact that Pittsburgh became this kind of melting pot pot of just people from all walks of life uh in a really quick way uh suddenly in the 1890s you know with with the invention of the steel and just trees coming out and frick and all that stuff and so many people moving to pittsburgh specifically pittsburgh to come here and work all the way up until the 1940s and 50s really uh with a steady increase of population becoming one of the most populated places in all of north america at one point uh, I think it was like number five or something like that. Wow. Uh, now, you know, if we're on any kind of list compared to the amount of stuff that we have and the amount of population that's left, mm -hmm. very little. I mean, we're so 
under what we used to have even. But I think because of that influx of all those people coming here and the capitalism that was going on and the people, uh, the true people who had this kind of money all of a sudden, uh, who were visionaries, people like George Westinghouse, who didn't uh, just build a mansion and just forget about it and never do anything else with the rest of his life. He saw things in other people that he wanted to help make to life. Same with Andrew Carnegie. Andrew Carnegie, people, you mentioned his name, people, you know, spit on his grave practically. And yet he saw that true success comes from helping others, people become successful. He doesn't want to just give it to you. He wants you to earn it like he did. And then if he, he'll teach you how to do it mm-hmm. because that is how he becomes successful. And, you know, that was the secret. It was, uh, was making other people's, um, you know, better. And I think in Pittsburgh, that's the case with most of these world firsts. There's some flukes out there, uh, but a lot of it had to do with somebody who had this kind of passion and this vision and the money involved because that, a lot of it does have to do with money, unfortunately. Uh, cause like I said, there's a the guy who invented the sewing machine, but nobody knows, you know, what the guy's name is. I mean, I do, but like not many people know who his name is and mm-hmm. you know, he died penniless, uh, like people just forgotten about for years. Uh, and you come across people like that in Pittsburgh, uh, history, like that, you know, d- 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 different individuals who did so much, uh, who left with nothing or no legacy whatsoever. People don't even remember their names and, and yet they contributed so great to our society. Uh, that they least could, should earn a mention briefly, of course, <laughs> for five minutes. You know, me to tell you that these things existed and they happened and they were created by people like you and me, who saw something, a vision that was something that was missing, and they figured out a way to to do it and never let someone tell them no. Everybody on this list is on that list for a reason, mm-hmm. and that's because they didn't give up. If and they this gave list, up, right, is a pretty long list. This list keeps getting bigger, believe it or not. Uh, I mean, we're not talking about a half dozen, dozen, no, couple of no. dozen. Hundred, over, well over a hundred. And these are such big, impactful things uh, in society as we know it. Mm-hmm. That at least I'm coming to this general conclusion that it re- Pittsburgh, out of any other city in the entire world, is where at least some of the most major things that have ever further advanced human civilization as we know it came out of this city. Now, uh, places like Philadelphia had the first public library, for example. That's a big deal, right? Mm. You know, you have the government, right? That's a big deal. But these things that I'm going to talk about, some of these, I'm just we're just going to go over them because you know, we will dig into stories, you know, attached with all these different things. But it's important to kind of get an overview of just the types of things that I'm talking about here. Right. Like huge big moments that anybody on earth would probably want to lay claim to it. And Pittsburgh does have this claim. And yet we do absolutely nothing about it. And so I think part of my, one of my visions, you know, for seeing the future of odd Pittsburgh even will involve these world firsts. And I want people, I want everybody to know that Pittsburgh is where these things came from. Give us some categories of things, of, of subjects that we're going to explore. Yeah. So entertainment category is one of my favorite ones to start off with because it, it's mind-blowing. So mm-hmm. we'll start with radio. Uh, so there's entertainment, entertainment, there's sports. Industries, innovations, uh, sports like you mentioned. You have uh, business firsts, education first, medical firsts, um, Political firsts, scientific firsts, technological firsts, you know, and, and these, when I say like technological firsts, you know, we're talking about major, major things uh, and inventions, the ones that cannot be claimed really by anybody else unless they try to. So now part of this list and part of trying to compile all this information mm-hmm. is trying to prove every single one of them wrong. <laughs> So you know that's something that many people don't want to do. Right, they want to throw out the claim, and they think if they claim it long enough and loud enough, that people will just accept it and not bother to look into it. Right. So you're going back to all of the historical claims Mm -hmm. that have been made about this region of firsts, and you are purposefully 
trying to debunk those claims. That's right. I practiced with the invention of Coca-Cola. So now, as we know, it has nothing to do with Pittsburgh. But that's a good example of the story about Pemberton, this doctor who invents this formula. You know, he's all coked up or whatever and weird and dies as of an overdose. Okay, this man. He, in a brief time period, he apparently sells the formula to Coca-Cola to some guy for like five bucks, you know? And uh, and he's the one who takes it and makes it into Coca-Cola that we know it today. But is there any truth to these rumors? Was there, was there even a Dr. Pemberton to begin with? You know, did he invent Coca-Cola? Was there other things like it just called, you know, something else, cola, you know? Like, were the ingredients of the same ingredients in some other drink? Or was it truly original? And, uh, shocker, and I guess it could come to shocker, <laughs> but it's all true. So for Dr. Pemberton, Pepperton and the invention of Coca-Cola and the situation that happened with him and everything in his whole life, it's 100% a true story. Other ones you find out are not a true story. And that wow. there's more to the story than anyone's ever even knew. And so what happens too, let me see if I get this right. In your effort to really validate, to challenge, to try to debunk, then you end up discovering evidence at times that cements it so firm right. that this is a world first. There's no disputing it. Yes. And that's the goal. So the goal is to try to do that with every single one of the claims. And I have, at least for the ones that I've highlighted on my list so far. Right. Uh, but once again, just because you put out there that this thing is the first, number one, not a lot of people called it the first, you know, when they were doing it, they just did it mm -hmm. and didn't think that they were the first or the second or last. They were just doing it because they saw a need that needed to be filled and they filled it. Uh, the first gas station is a perfect example. People were selling gas at every corner store you could possibly imagine for years. Well, doesn't that, does that make it a gas station? No, because they sold hay and feed and other things there too. It wasn't just a place you could pull up. Somebody would clean your windshield and check your oil and change your tires, all that type of stuff. That wasn't until some guy saw a need for something like that, like a separate building that did nothing but that and did it on here in Pittsburgh first, 1913 in East Liberty. <laughs> Gulf Oil, the company that did that. The first in Pennsylvania, right? No, the first in the world. And so there, there was no other dedicated building set up apparently anywhere that was dedicated to like gasoline service. Wow. And they promoted that fact as a world first. Uh, it was in all their marketing material for Gulf mm -hmm. Oil. I found an ad from the 20s that talked specifically. They made a joke about it. Yeah, and the, and there's like a drawing, a cartoon ad where this husband and wife are driving and he's liberty and they drive onto the sidewalk. He's like, Henry, you're on the sidewalk. They're like, no, that's, you're supposed to do that. That's how gas stations work. You drive right up to the building. <laughs> right. <laughs> so there's like these things, this evolution of uh, ideas and, yes. and people seeing a need and somewhere where to fill it. Then you have people who are just, you know, the, the tinkerer trades, I guess you could best call them. People like George Westinghouse um, and Tesla and all these people who invent things. Things that, um, again, saw a missing link and figured out a way to do it better and somehow was able to do it in Pittsburgh. I thought a lot, a lot of it has to do with, I think, the fact that there's money in Pittsburgh at that time. Mm -hmm. And that there are certain people who just can see somebody else, see a good idea, and they know to invest in that person because it's going to make them successful ultimately. Right. Uh, and Westinghouse was the perfect example because he did that with Tesla he did that with many different people who invented things. Uh, he saw a good invention. He would bring them to Pittsburgh, make them work here. So what you're describing to me sounds like the Silicon Valley of today. You go back in Pittsburgh's history and all the venture capital money that just pours into Silicon mm -hmm. Valley for the latest, greatest technology. We were that hub. Yes. That uh, made all that 100%, possible. 100%. Um, entertainment is one of the, my favorite you know, categories. And uh, when you start looking into these factoids, like what even is entertainment? So entertainment, it's radio, TV, movies, right? Well, mm -hmm. every single one of those things has the origin in Pittsburgh as a world first. Not in any other city, not in Hollywood, not in Chicago, not in New York. Pittsburgh is where radio began. Pittsburgh is where television began. Pittsburgh is where movie theaters began. Pittsburgh is where video phones Pittsburgh is where touch tone phones began. Pittsburgh is where area codes began. Pittsburgh, I mean, 
do I have to go on? Wow. So like, that's just that. And then you're not even looking into the stories behind all those things because it, 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 there's the invention of television in 1923 has its own tale in Westinghouse. The corporation was involved, not the man, but the corporation. Mm-hmm. Um, same with radio. Like it, it had to do with someone new, you know, thought he'd be a good idea to make money selling radios, but they had nothing to put on the radios. So they had to invent something to put on the radios, which would then sell the radios and everybody would be happy and became this kind of business. And not just like this idea of a radio. Right. And so where these ideas became legitimate things that you can market and sell, that's where Pittsburgh, I think, uh, plays the pivotal role. Um, lots of people have plenty of ideas, like that guy for this, this, you know, the sewing machine, like we talked about. You know, lots, lots of people have these ideas, but never do anything about them. And I, I'm one of those people. <laughs> I got plenty of ideas. I just don't do anything about them. I have an idea for barcoded license plates. Right, that would successfully work. You would never be able to hide. You'd find it. You'd never be another Amber Alert because I know where every car is. I know everything about the person who's driving that car. Right? Do I want that technology in my car? No. <laughs> do I see how that you you could do it for the better, greater good, and that right. it might be beneficial and create some sort of police state? Yes, I see that. I see that you could do things like that mm-hmm. with any kind of thing. But there's always better. the give and take. There's always the give and take. So I think a lot of these people, you know, have you know, and when you say World first, like uh, that first in flight thing where, where there's a guy, it might be another guy in Pittsburgh who flew an airplane earlier than the Wright brothers. But there were early people even earlier than him flying. Leonardo da Vinci in the year 1500 was trying to invent flying machines. Shouldn't he be credited as part of the early, you know, world first of aviation? Uh, what about all these other people that tried to jump off some cliff with wings <laughs> and didn't make it? You know, do they just go forgotten or do we have to mention them as well? I am in the 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 thought process of at the moment at least of acknowledging them all and not just pin picking you know one person out however there are people involved in all these industries and things who are the most prominent of the ones mm-hmm. who should be recognized and uh, maybe above and beyond some of the other ones who failed and the first person to succeed at one of these things and but it is important to talk about the failures because they, without the failures you wouldn't have the succeed succeeding ones Mm -hmm. so uh but to tell the complete story yes of all these factoids like um one i found out recently that i didn't know beforehand was that pre-packaged coffee like the coffee that you buy from johnny or any anywhere and like coffee in a thing that you could buy that was a pittsburgh thing arbuckle coffee company were the ones who first did that that was during the civil war time period prior to that you could only buy like whole beans you know out of a bucket (laughs) at market square or something like that uh, this guy figured out a way to successfully package pre-ground coffee. Uh, change the way that millions of people would have a brine <laughs> for breakfast. So, so, like, these little things that some guys are like, oh, I think people would probably want to buy a Yeah, that simple in a bag. invention all of a sudden makes it to where coffee is easily consumed by countless numbers of people. Yeah. So, you know, think about people, like, just that invention alone has affected, let right. alone... All that stuff, the entertainment stuff is, is the craziest because it, it really is mind-blowing to think that we have, the city of Pittsburgh, have an opportunity to tout to the entire world that the first movie theater to ever exist, that was in Pittsburgh on Smithfield Street. There's documented evidence, there's photographs, plenty of things to go along this. And yet, if you were to ask somebody where was the first movie theater... Number one, nobody would probably know. Number two, they would probably say New York or Chicago or Hollywood, yeah, Los Angeles, right. something like that. They wouldn't think like Pittsburgh in 1903. Like movies weren't even really a thing, you know, in 1903. So it's like, but you have like, so I, I feel at the moment, my job part in part now is to promote those things and just do something about it, not just sit on that fact and be like, oh, it's... uh uh, the only uh, I can I can't get too deep into sports uh, world first because there's too many. But a big one to talk about is the first World Series. So you think you have as a baseball organization, mm-hmm. you lucked out to be the team that was in the first World Series. You have that no matter how bad you suck for the rest of your <laughs> life as the Pittsburgh Pirates. You will no one will ever be able to take that fact away from you. Something that you've never celebrated. <laughs> So now you think they'd have throwbacks or Rain. or whatever, have the descendants of the people who played in the game or whatever. You know, 
even do as simple as simple as putting up a sign in front of where it even happened. That is a struggle, believe it or not. So it's uh, it's a lot of it has to do with just lack of knowledge. It's it's not um, anybody's fault uh, per se. It's just the fact that this type of information was so hard to compile previously mm-hmm. that you had to pick so many different random sources. And then even then it was never complete. It was never like, it was just what people like, okay, I guess this is as much as we can figure out now. And I know that even if I put these all in a book, like the next month I'd probably find 10 more. Mm-hmm. It's just a matter of um, seeing like how that, um, you know, what all these, like what is the effect of each and every single one of these huge important world changing some of them humanity changing mm. like uh one of my favorite ones to talk about when i give a speech somewhere or uh, or talk about anything in general is of all the different types of things that you could invent or perfect um one of these things so you got the like the physical things like movies and televisions and all that type of stuff but what right. about like conceptual things is there something like that that pittsburgh could lay a claim to and there is. There's actually two of them, but the, the fir- they're both related. But the first one is literally the invention of what we, today we call standard time. So a Pittsburgher named Samuel Langley in the 1880s had the unique privilege by the U.S. government to push a button at noon on a certain day that would synchronize all the clocks in the United States. So now... Uh, so it, This is where it starts. Literally, Riverview Park... Yes, in that building, there's a button somewhere. I don't know <laughs> what happened to that button, uh, but it really, truly did happen. Someone here changed the course of time. Prior to that, you know, prior to this event happening, nobody knew what time it was. <laughs> as hard as I believe, it, you would have like a big building around like your church or a city mm-hmm. hall, and that would have the clock on it, right? And that's what everybody went on. If that was wrong, everybody was wrong. Yeah, and so uh, it's one of the reasons why you have bells and church bells is to let people yeah. know what time it is because like nobody really knows <laughs> so like uh but at least we, we had to figure it out for railroad purposes especially and that is the reason why that particular thing had to be standardized and my understanding is is that not only did you have uh, the questions of time about whether or not your time is the right time or this person's the right time but the claim of time mm-hmm. uh, by the hour would vary from not only state to state or region to region, but all the way down to municipality. Yeah. yeah. That they would recognize one time zone, then you go a little bit further along, then you're in a different time zone. It was just complete chaos. Chaos. As you were going from place to place for any length of time. Yeah. And and luckily it's not like that anymore because of Pittsburgh. Right. Now, uh, it happened again in Dorm World War One, where another Pittsburgher um, – came up with and finalized legally the idea of daylight savings time. So Pittsburgh literally was able to change and challenge father time, spit in his face <laughs> two times, <laughs> not just once, but two times. Got you twice, man. Yeah. Somehow. <laughs> and, I mean, think about that I impact. Like that. If you can literally change something that everybody in the world depends upon. Um, this guy did that. Pittsburghers did that. Uh, and that's where it becomes, the most mind-boggling thing about these lists of world first. And then it, it goes into medical, events. too, doesn't it? Yeah, medical, it's ridiculous. Like, the creation of the EMS. I, I, it was, most people, I assume, are, it's kind of like a given that you just assume things like an ambulance or EMS always existed. Uh, a lot of people, when you go, especially when you talk to kids, even talk to my kids and I talked to them about Nintendo. Like, it's hard for them to even imagine there was a time period before Nintendo. Like that, it just didn't exist at one point. <laughs> well, it's the same thing with all these medical world first. At one time, there was no such thing as an X ray. There was no such thing as an MRI. There was no such thing as EMS or emergency medical services. There was no such thing as an ICU unit. Um, all those things, with the exception of the first one I mentioned, the uh, uh, X rays. But everything else I mentioned there MRIs, EMS, ambulance services, uh, ICU units, those were all Pittsburgh inventions transplants, mm-hmm. medical transplants of human body parts between things. That was a whole fascinating story by Thomas Starzl, first person to ever do a uh, lung transplant and a heart transplant. Uh, also did many other different types of transplants here in Pittsburgh. Uh, considered Frankenstein at the time. Uh, we had to go to, you've seen that 
Mr. Rogers video where he has to go in front of Congress and plead his case to try to save PBS. Dr. Starz Starz had to do the same thing in Pittsburgh to try to plead to the U.S. government because they thought he was Frankenstein for taking a, you know, an organ wow. off of somebody and transplanting it to somebody else, cutting them open and putting pieces together like you're playing God. So how do you, you know, all he was trying to do is save people's lives. Right. So how do you go, <laughs> how do you defend that? Uh, I'm just trying to save your life. You know, I, yes, I'm taking dead body parts of animals or whatever and growing them in labs and sticking them in you, but you're alive. <laughs> right. I saved your life. And like, um, so people constantly telling him not to do it, constantly being ashamed even to do what he's doing at one point in his life. Mm -hmm. I mean, luckily it, you know, ended up well. Right. But like there's buildings named after him today, but back then not hundred percent. No, all these people told him no, and he did not give up. Just kept on going anyway. And every one of these things I'm talking nice. about, you know, maybe with the exception of standard time, because that's a unique, you do have unique specific things like that. But most of the other things like the invention of the first crematorium or the, the, uh, the refinement of aluminum, you know, the, the, like all these people said, nobody wants a new type of metal. Right. You know, we got plenty of metal out here. We got iron, we got steel. We don't need a third metal. <laughs> In fact, the invention of aluminum by Charles Martin Hall is the mm -hmm. guy who, who did that. Um, that substance was the first known metal to be discovered since the Iron Age. <laughs> so now wow. think about all like an impactful. Now they made an aluminum skyscraper out of that material. Yes. They, they were able to can food for the first time and make it safe because of aluminum. They were able to you know, do all that type of stuff because of, of that invention. World changing. And, um, and yet, you know, I'm, you know, I'm sure most people know like Alcoa was from Pittsburgh, but maybe people might not know the deep history behind it and why it was created, how it was invented, you know, how the struggles that that guy had to go through to try to prove that this thing is like a legitimate type of thing that you could use. Mm -hmm. And um, we take all that for advantage. And uh, some people don't, uh, most people wouldn't have no idea that, who that guy's name even is. Um, but they did things on purpose. They tried to leave a legacy. One of my favorite, um, well, not my favorite, but it's one of the, the most un unusual tales about an invention in Pittsburgh it had to do with the printing press. So prior to this man coming around, his name was William Bullock, but prior to him coming around, the only mm -hmm. way to print, mass print the book was page by page, you know, typeset, like screen printing, like you did a T-shirt, mm -hmm. one page at a time. So now most cities had newspapers, and one thing you notice about old newspapers, they're only four or five pages long because it took that much time to, you know, reset all the type print and everything. But this guy figured out a way to have, like, a roll of paper that you could just feed through a machine that could continuously print on, like, large amounts of text and print newspapers 100 pages long. All of a sudden, you could print 10 copies of a book. It wouldn't take you all year to break one copy of a book. Um, and change the way that humanity kind of rose out of the dark ages from the 1860s onward because of that invention. Now, for the first time ever, reading material was easily and cheaply acquired. <laughs> so that's how big of an uh, impact one guy can make. Now, was he the first person to ever figure out you could print more than one page at once? Probably not. But he did make this machine. He did patent it to accounts. Yes. Um, late one night in 1867, the machine got caught, and he went to try to yank it out and got sucked into his own machine and was decapitated. And is on the oh, list wow. of, like, there's only 15 people maybe that have ever invented things that are known. But it's on that list, short list of inventors killed by their own invention. <laughs> but he, uh, his name is William Bullock. Did that continuous web rotary pr printing press is the invention that he invented. Mm -hmm. uh, but that thing and this legacy, and, and I'm, I guarantee you, anybody listening to this and anybody that's ever even heard me tell this tale, unless you're like a freak like me, you wouldn't, <laughs> you wouldn't know. You would never know that guy was eaten alive by this invention and the fact that this invention such has a, such an impact on your daily life that you don't even think about it. Like every book printed behind me was printed with his invention. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, like uh, that's pretty impactful. It is, and you think that uh, you know it's we, we'd be the changing. It is. It, it all most of these things are societal changing world events. Things taking like raw petroleum out of the ground and refining it to become oil. That was a Pittsburgh invention, um, one of many. That's like a prime example of taking some or gas 
um, wild natural gas is shooting out of the ground, Pittsburgh figured out a way to cap the gas, how to pipe the gas, how to measure the gas with a gas meter. Mm -hmm. All those things were invented by Pittsburgh. So now think about how many people have gas meters around the world. You wouldn't have them if it wasn't for George Westinghouse. Right. No, you, it might have been invented. A lot of these things are inevitable. You, you see a lot of them, either a lot of people were already creating them all at once, and then one guy just did it first, but there was mm -hmm. 15 other people who did it also. Right. Um, but only one guy succeeded somehow. Um, other people you find, like those hidden figures, people like that Gustav Whitehead who are, or nobody knows about, who died homeless and penniless, and, and, uh, and yet people only now are uncovering this guy's legacy and truth. Uh, enough to fill volumes of books about it. But when this guy died, Gustav, nobody knew anything about him. He was a, what a complete shame. failure. Um, now there's hundreds and hundreds of newspaper articles about this guy that were uncovered. It's uh, almost as though he's being resurrected from the dead. Yeah, no, 100%. Now, the uh, all these people, you know, when I talk about any one of these people, like that William Bullock, how many people in the world today do you think at this very moment are talking about the, the 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 printing press and about William Bullock's life and his circumstance. I guarantee you we're the only people on earth at the moment talking about this man. Now, part of that is goes back to that saying that I say mm -hmm. about dying the two deaths. Right. Um, you know, the first one you're natural, the second one time speaks your name. Literally what we're doing right now is bringing that William Bullock, his idea and his invention, the man who struggled, you know, died an unfortunate death. Uh, which I guarantee you nobody's talking about right this moment. Uh, we're getting that brief Andy Warhol-esque 15 minutes of fame mm. for for all these different people. So, And I do kind of feel that way a little bit about uh, that legacy of Andy Warhol's and then what I have the opportunity to do, which is like, yeah, Andy Warhol said that everybody gets their 15 minutes of fame, but nobody told you how or you know right. how to do that. And like, uh, I'm the facilitator of that for some of these historical figures. Yeah, giving them 15 minutes more. Right. You might never think about them again. Maybe deep down at some bar someday, you're in a trivia contest, and you'd be like, oh, did you know television was invented in Pittsburgh <laughs> and you know, movie theaters and radio and all this other? Like, hopefully I played a small role nice. in that eventual, like, I know that I will be anonymous and that it will be like, just enter into the world of Pittsburgh history um, is to kind of see that, like, and I do see that already. I see stories that have taken their life of their own, uh, especially when they first in flight. They'd be like, I heard one guy, there was a guy here in Pittsburgh that did it. I don't know how I heard this story, but I heard it someday. And, and you know, all these things, it's like they had no clue that, like, I originated those stories. They've already taken a life of their own. They've already become part of, like, Pittsburgh lore. And uh, <laughs> sometimes even, like the, like, the wrong information or, like, the Bellevue House of Mystery, there's so much to that story. Mm -hmm. But people only know, like, what I've, loosely posted about and it's been now like a game of telephone to where all they know is there's a mysterious house in Bellevue. <laughs> so there's all these type of neat things, but I do feel a little bit of like that, especially for the world first being the facilitator of these ideas mm -hmm. of all these world firsts and the impacts of them all, right. but also being humble enough to know that it doesn't like, just because I say the guy did it first, I know that there's more to that story. Right. You know, so I do try to explore all these stories and try to find out if there is truth. There are ones that are some claims like the gas station that it's like you could kind of take it or leave it if it's truly the world's first. Because there are claims of people having like a shed that he opened up and he could sell gas out of it on the weekends. So does that count <laughs> as uh, the first? It at least counts as a mention. And it's interesting. Correct. It goes back to that aspect of. Here is where the river starts, mm -hmm. but there's all these tributaries. It's not called the river until you get it to a particular size. That's right. That's right. And then, but you have perfect. to recognize perfect all yeah. of the tributaries that make it. Yeah, that's in perfect, the first place. That's perfect analogy. That's yes. the truth. Yeah, all the creeks and all that stuff all mm -hmm. eventually becomes the river. And um, you know, I want to talk about the creeks. Right. And give them their proper credit, because That's without right. them, you would never have the river in the first place. You got that right. John Shokoski of the odd, mysterious, fascinating history of Pittsburgh. Find him on social media, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, just by typing in at Odd Pittsburgh. Thank you for listening to the Mangino Talks podcast. New episodes drop Monday through Friday at 3 p.m. Eastern. For more on me and the show, be sure to visit ManginoTalks.com. 
Follow me on your favorite social media platform by using at Mangino Talks, or you can just Google Mangino Talks. Once you find me, please like, follow, subscribe, and share the pages with your friends and your family. And thanks again for listening to the Mangino Talks podcast.